Well, on behalf of the San Diego flight crew, I'd like to thank you all of us for flying Good Samaritan Airlines. In preparation for a landing in Godland, the captain has asked that you put on your seatbelts and put your seats in a fully upright position. When we land, you can exit the plane in two ways. You can go the tourist way, off to the malls, Petco Park, whatever you need to do, or you can exit with the pilgrims. <laughs> I want to talk about Godland and what that is. Because Isaiah is a fascinating book that talks about Godland and what God expects. And our passage from chapter 58 today is like a little microcosm of what that entire 66 chapter book says. So the book of Isaiah is a chronicling over hundreds of years. Um, there was a, definitely a, a prophet named Isaiah, and then there were people in subsequent times um, who kept on the story and the themes of the book of Isaiah. So the book of Isaiah is God speaking through Isaiah to people, um, Israelites who have struggled to remain faithful to God because they are trapped between the warring communities of the Assyrian Empire and the Egyptian empires and not being very good at warfare any, at, of themselves at the moment, are struggling to maintain their national identity in between these other communities, these warring communities that want to run right over them. And so sometimes God is saying, trust me, I will protect you, I will help you to defeat your enemy, or at least I will keep you from getting run over by them. And other times God is saying through Isaiah, you're going to lose this battle. Do not resist. Go with them. Let them take the temple. Let them take your homes. You're going to Babylon for a while. And it's a chronicling of the people listening or not listening to God and how God feels about that. And what God wants to impress upon them is a couple of different things. And the same themes are throughout this entire book. He wants the people of God to be a people of justice. And justice means justice like in courts, like not defrauding your neighbor, not lying, bearing false witness. And it means taking care of the poor. That is exactly what justice means, and it never changes throughout the 66 verses. Are you taking care of the widows and the orphans? Are you clothing the naked? Are you feeding the hungry? And the other theme throughout Isaiah is are you keeping your covenant with me? And that covenant is fairly narrowly defined as, are you keeping the Sabbath holy? Are you following the cultic worship, the covenant that I ask of you? Those are the two things that God emphasizes throughout. Now, most of the time that Isaiah and his followers were speaking to people, it was chaotic times. As I mentioned, their nation was under threat, they were constantly attacked by the Assyrians or other people later, the Babylonians. Sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. Their society was an upheaval. And what a lot of the followers of God thought it was easier to do was just give in. Whatever they're doing, do it. If they're going up and worshiping the trees and the hills, just do it. To get along with culture, to survive. Thus God's repeated unhappiness throughout the book of Isaiah. Now, in our time, as Christians, we have something called the baptismal covenant, right? And so we have a, the same covenant with God that Israel had, and that includes worshiping the Ten Commandments and, and all the other ethics surrounding those Ten Commandments. But we also have our baptismal covenants, which we repeat on certain days of the year when we're baptizing somebody or at All Saints Day or Easter. And we say, will you continue, not will you start, Will you continue in the apostles' teachings and fellowship in the breaking of bread and the prayers? In other words, will you do this? This is the apostles' teaching. We just heard Jesus' teaching. Theoretically, I'm supposed to be teaching right now. The fellowship, you gathering here, gathering there, gathering in each other's homes. The breaking of bread, ta-da. The prayers, you will hear our prayers later. And it includes other things, such as small groups, Bible studies, uh, volunteering for the poor. You know, there are a variety of ways in which we continue that community of teaching and fellowship outside of Sunday worship. But it's primarily God saying, will you keep 
the Sabbath holy. Now, I talk about Godland because God talks about Godland. So I reread Isaiah last night just to make sure I was not misremembering. And here is what Isaiah says God is telling him. Remember all those countries I was talking about? All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. In other words, our citizenship in our countries does not matter at all to God. All God cares about is that we are citizens of God's land, also known as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of God. Whatever you call it, it means the people who are following God. And goes, God goes on to say, and anybody, whether it's eunuchs from another country, whether it's people who've been captured by Israel in war and have come to Jerusalem, whoever, anybody who follows my covenant, those are my people. Those are my citizens. And what does God want us to do? To take care of the poor, to feed the needy, and to keep the Sabbath holy, to participate in worship. I don't think I really need to tell anybody at this church to take care of the poor. You have been taking care of the poor since this church started in 1970-something. 70? 1970? 1974? I can't remember. In any case. But all churches have been and, and houses of worship, not just Christian churches, have been under the thrall of another enemy, not wartime anymore, not empires trying to take us over, but a disease that threatened us, that took lives by the millions in our world, and that sent us all home and unable to be here, unable to worship in public, unable to gather for small groups, unable to do showers of blessings or to do feeding programs. Feeding programs were shut down all over the world, and houses of worship were shut down all over the world. And then, slowly, they started to open up again. There were ways to worship again. We're lucky in having a highly aerated room, a large room, very lucky in that sense, others not as lucky. And then all the religious leaders are saying, but the churches are half full or a third full. Where are they? This is why I want to talk about tourists versus pilgrims. And I had a great opportunity during my sabbatical to see what the difference is between a tourist and a pilgrim and what God actually is asking from us in our covenant with God. So I've been on two official pilgrimages. That's where a group of people get together and we're saying, we're going to go to Canterbury on pilgrimage. I did that in seminary. And then I went on a pilgrimage to Iona with a bunch of other people. There's a big difference between tourists and pilgrims. Tourists go someplace cool. In general, they go with people they know and love. They're going with friends or family, people they have carefully chosen to have a great time with. And their goal is to see as many cool things as they can. Right? So, oh, we're going to go to Paris. We're going to see the Pantheon and the Louvre and Notre Dame, and we're going to take a boat ride on the Seine, and then we're going to go to Siena, we're going to see the Palazzo this and that and that, and we're going to go for, run from place to place. And I saw a lot of tourists in Europe this summer. In general, tourists have a menu of things, and they're saying, what cool things, how many cool things can I get done? How many cool things can I get done with the people I like so much? And in general, they're busy because you spent all this money. You got to see at least six things in Florence today because you paid for that hotel room in Florence. I was a pilgrim in Iona. And first of all, you can cover Iona in an hour. It is three miles long and one mile wide. 120 people live on this island. And it has a very famous abbey called the Iona Abbey. And it also has a nunnery, a convent, that was not rebuilt in the 19th century by a rich guy. So they didn't rebuild the convent. They did, did build the thing where the male, uh, the male monks had been. But it is now an abbey for people of all genders and a pilgrimage site. I was there with pilgrims. We stayed at a hotel right by it. And the things that are unique about the pilgrims is that, one, you don't, in general, choose the company of the people you're in. It's anybody who wants to go on the pilgrimage. You're with them. It has a spiritual leader. It has a rhythm of worship and prayer every day in seminary required of us. Everybody's going to these things. Uh, the thing I went to this summer, not exactly required, but why go on a pilgrimage if you don't want to participate in the, in the evening prayer, in the morning prayer, in the teaching that they did every day at 1030? 
And why wouldn't you want to go meditate in the little chapel where St. Columba used to go meditate? It's centered around some holy site where something important happened and where a very holy person, usually somebody venerated, not, not worshipped, venerated for their extremely holy life was. In this case, St. Columba. The pilgrims tend to have roles. If any of you, how many of you read or heard of the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer? Hey, not bad. Okay, if you remember, everybody has their role. There are clerical types. There uh, is a wife of Bath. There's the miller. You know, people have their job. But they also have jobs on the trip. So somebody collects donations from people called the almoner, and then you give to worthy causes in your community. So we did that. We had an almoner who went around and asked the people in the Isle of Iona, what do you need? And the local school teacher for the X number of chil few children on the aisle said, we could really use a greenhouse-like thing so we can teach children creation care and growing things, but in Scotland, you need to have it covered part of the year. And so we did it. We raised all of the money for that. They needed $18,000, and this crowd of 14 people managed to get that pulled together with one request. We served one another. There were porters, stronger people who could take all of our baggage, you know, because there's some people brought bags this big, um, and put them in the bottom of the buses and then brought them out and brought them into the hotel lobbies for us so everybody wouldn't have to be hurting their back bending over. My job was to read poetry to people. Great job. Um, yeah, some people were in charge of making sure everybody made it on the bus. So we served one another. We served one another. That's a huge difference. But the other difference that I saw when I was Iona was like this, and I'm going to act it out for you. So you get off at a ferry that comes from the Isle of Mole across this little strait in the Atlantic, and you get off at this little um, landing place, and the tourists were like this. Remember, one, you know, three miles long, and it's punctuated by a couple of holy sites and a few tourist shops and restaurants. And the tourists are going like this. There's that. Look at the nunnery. Oh, look, uh, one thing about the nunnery. Okay, uh, let's stop here and get the coffee, and then let's go into the abbey, picture, 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 and let's go spend money on the pretty silver necklaces at the store. That was the tourist. Now, most of you know, I saw no, knowing nods in the morning, that I tend to move quickly. You'll see me on Sunday morning coming, uh, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Uh, 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 is somebody making the coffee? Where are the extra? Uh, uh. I slowed down in Iona because all we have to do as a pilgrim, you know, we'd eat and they'd say in a couple hours, like a couple hours? What do I do for a couple hours? What do you do on a holy island for a couple hours? You take a walk. You go say hi to the sheep. You look at the ocean. You pray. And then at 10.30, they, you sing songs together, you pray, they teach you something about some Irish saint. And then they say, and in a couple hours we have lunch. I'm like, a couple hours? You slow down. The pilgrim is not looking at the menu of things to do. The pilgrim sort of has what they do for the day. We're going to pray, we're going to worship, we're going to eat, we're going to play. We did play, we had fun things that we did. Might go off to a boat trip on the Isle of Staffa and see the cute puffins. Spent a lot of time saying hello to the airy coo. All the cows in Scotland are called airy coo. That's hairy cow. Airy coo. Say hello to, we'd like, what's that cow's name? Airy coo. What's that cow's name? Airy coo. Like, oh, you get it. They're all the same to you. But we related to all of creation as well. We were pilgrims. We were totally focused on the lives of holy people who had been there, totally focused on worship, totally focused on prayer, on the cycle of creation and God's creation and how we are part of it, that the sheep, the sheep and the cows are as important beings on that island as we were. We were pilgrims. And here's the interesting thing. Then I went to Italy on what you might have considered a touristy thing. I rode a bike with a friend every day, uh, a very Christian friend who attends an evangelical church and a Bible study and small group every week. And you had an opportunity as you were riding along the hillsides of Tuscany to see famous sites. Well, we weren't going to go wine tasting, which is one of the famous things you can do, because you got to get back on that bike and get up hills. And if you've been drinking wine, it's not going to happen. 
So we did not do wine tasting in Italy, at least not while we were riding our bikes. There were things like monasteries and churches, castles, and we always stopped at the monasteries and churches. And we always prayed. And we stopped at one very famous one that some of you have probably heard of. It's the Benedictine Monastery, still a working monastery with modern day monks. And it's called Monte Oliveto Maggiore, somewhere south of Montalcino. Um, and we showed up in our cycling clothes and our water bottles, you know, and we walked in and I could see the young woman running the concession there, kind of looking us up and down. And I spoke to her in Italian, you know, trying to, trying to make her happy. And um, I said, you know, can we go into the church? And she said, 10 euros. Fine, we'll pay 10 euros each. And she goes, that's a way. Okay, we'll go this way. That's where the tourists were going. We went into a cloister, you know, the cloister is the enclosed area of a monastery or a convent where late medieval and early Renaissance painters had painted um, frescoes of the entire life of St. Benedict of the fourth century, I think, um, all around. It took us an hour to look at all of them and for me to read and try to translate what the Italian said, and now St. Benedict cures the woman of whatever. And then we walked out, and all the other tourists were doing this too. And then I went back to the woman and I said, can we go in the church? Because I, I couldn't find the church. And she goes, that way. So we go in the church, and it's empty. Nobody went into the church. Nobody. But we did, because every time we went into a church, we wanted to sit down and pray, because it was a holy site. This, this monastery had been here forever, forever, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we looked at a couple of famous paintings, and then we sat down, and then we listened to a monk practicing his organ for, you know, the next time they were going to worship. And nobody else joined us to worship because they were tourists. They were taking pictures on the outside. Honey, stand in front of that. Let's take a picture. Now we've got to go do the next thing. Tourists rushing around trying to figure out how to fit in everything that they need to fit in versus pilgrims just saying, let's stop for as long as we want to stop and just sit in this holy place and soak it in. The whole trip became a pilgrimage. And I don't know how many people said to me, how was it, what did you do? And I feel a little silly. I didn't actually, what I really did was go from place to place and pray. That's what I did. And I know you want to think, you know, I did this in London, I did this, and but I actually didn't do anything in London. And when my friend said, and Dor said, what do you want to do? I said, I, I want to hike around with you. That's what I want to do. That's all I want to do. And we ended up going to a famous pilgrimage path in Dorset, England, and going into an ancient chapel called St. Catherine's Church that is now a, a, a ruin. No worship happens there. And there's a little alcove this big in the wall, and people to this day are putting papers in there with prayers. Pilgrims, not tourists. I mention this because I'm frequently talking to people. I call people up and say, I haven't, haven't seen you, I haven't seen the kids. I'm just wondering how, how are Sundays going for you? Oh, you know, we're so busy. There are so many activities to choose from. That's what people say, so many activities to choose from. I understand, I, I had my Sundays off and I thought, I wonder what it'd be like. To just go. What do other people do on Sundays? I'm kind of curious. And I saw what other people did, they're busy. They're busy. Just, Taking an hour, an hour and a half to sit still with other people that you didn't pick and serving one another and helping one another, doing your job for one hour for one another, that doesn't rank highly compared to, I don't know, going to see the Padres play or hitting the anniversary sale at Nordstrom's or going to see your family or whatever. It's a difference between being a tourist and being a pilgrim. And I'm not just talking about going on a trip. I'm talking about traveling through Godland, that is our life here, together in the world, as a pilgrim instead of as a tourist. Not rating our time in Godland and how many cool things did I get, get to do or see, but how much time did I get to spend knowingly in the presence of God on sacred ground. Are we tourists 
or are we pilgrims?